Hello, viewers. I'm SB, and welcome to Citizen Sleeper. I don't know very much about this game. I know that it's a, a narrative-heavy science fiction sort of cyberpunk. Listen, this is a game about living in a capitalist dystopia, which is, you know, resonant. There are <laughs> there are things about this that are going to feel familiar. A lot of the a lot of the people whose opinions I respect about video games have been raving about this, so I figured. What better way to learn about it than for us to all find out together, right? I have very, very little idea. Okay, so like, yeah, even this. The fact that there are character classes is something of a surprise to me. An operator works with drones and high-precision remote machines to perform complex tasks at a distance. Well, I am a coward, so that does sort of sound like me. Chance to gain cryo on interface actions. I mean, this, we have, I have no idea what this means. We could be an extractor. Resource extraction, often in hard vacuum environments. This is, this is tough belter work here. Energy recovery at home, thanks to your photosynthetic skin. And we have some stats here. We could kind of, sort of, guess what they might be used for. Is it just the two? No, okay, there's three, but you start looking at the middle one. A machinist repairs and modifies automated systems used in industrial resource extraction. Yo, that does kind of sound like what we do here, right? Chance to gain a random scrap item on engineer actions, at which we are particularly good. Not so good at approaching problems head-on. Prefers a an overcomplicated solution. I think this is us. I think this, this is me. I will say that I don't think this looks the coolest of the character arts we've seen, but yeah, this one this one resonates. I might want to, there might be some audio adjustment going on here. Um, I didn't play any of the game to find the audio levels out because I didn't want to learn anything before turning the camera on. So we'll, we'll see. The first thing you become aware of on waking is the disconnect, the delay between thinking and feeling, between wanting to act and acting. Minor, almost imperceptible, but always present. Sort of a physical lag. Actually a very familiar feeling. <laughs> Uh, so... It's at its worst when walking. Or when waking, sorry. <clears throat> when yourself has spent many dark hours recalling what it felt like to be real, to be a person, to be in a body that was indisputably yours. This is gonna... <laughs> this is gonna be a heavy game to play during transition, isn't it? Uh, let's... Let's think of that body. A leap into a cold lake on a hot day, the sting of blood welling from a fresh wound, the friction of a fingertip. All of a sudden, the memories are closer than you thought, blurring as you approach, until you can't tell one from the other. The cold slips in behind and around you, and the sensations fade out of reach. Perhaps you should be thankful for the dulled nature of this new body, given your current circumstances. The walls of the container feel immediately present, cold, hard, at your back and face, cramping your limbs. You resist the desire to stretch, knowing that the claustrophobia comes next, and retreat a little from your central nervous system. It isn't painful, not like you used to know pain, at least. In emergency mode, pain is a message delivered with efficiency and ease, a reminder that harm is imminent. There is no insistent throb, no trembling nerves, just a warning delivered with the banal quality of a digital notification. Right now, there are thousands of them. Um, so presumably we're being shipped somewhere, right? Am I more interested in remembering what that's about? Or no, I want, I want to know about the others. Presumably we are not alone here. You remember there were ten of you. Ten that could no longer stand the indentured work, the routines, the slow decay. Ten whose belief in their promised future was slowly dismantled day by day, until they realized they had sold away everything that could and would ever matter. Ten that would escape, or at least die trying. Some were lost in the shaft. Others never found the meeting point. Only a few made it to the containers. But the freighter, as far as you know, left. That feels like enough. Enough to know that you might no longer be on that grim and heartless rock. 
even if in the airless hold of a freighter, you might freeze solid long before you reached any destination. Okay, so not exactly shipped. We're in our escape plan from where we were being worked to death. So these are the same option. It's just a matter of outlook, I suppose. Um, if I'm honest, this is where I would be at. I definitely have a broad expectation that something bad will happen. And, you know, like in some ways it's a useful strategy, like in the sense that it means I'm pleasantly surprised by things a lot. We might freeze solid long before we reach any destination. Let us just wait for it to happen. Doesn't seem like there's anything else to do here anyway. That's all there is now. It has been a long time since you left. Surely weeks, maybe months. You are dully aware of damage to your legs and your right arm. You've been reserving energy as much as possible, but even then your body has shut many of its systems down to protect you. You've spent much of that time asleep, knowing that anything else would be impossible to endure. You feel the weight of that impossibility begin to gather. It is time to sleep again, to nudge this false body into inducing delta waves in your emulated mind, and, once again, recoil into a dream of when you were once a person. Time passes. The cold creeps further in. You feel something. Warmth. Not true warmth, but the indication of its presence. Your joints release from their rigor. Sound, too, everywhere, screeching and shimmering so loud that your body ducks your hearing to protect its sensors. Then light, white as the cold. Then softer and softer, until in a haze of dirty yellow, a figure appears. You're out. Oh. Okay, so we're still in space. Is this how this was supposed to go? It has been a few hours since Dragos pulled you from the container. You sit huddled in a corner of his scrapyard, swaddled in the reflective folds of a mylar blanket. You're slowly coming back to consciousness, back to life, and you stare at the ornately curving element of an improvised heater. I don't know if this is how this was supposed to go. You are surrounded by angular, incoherent lump lumps of ships, some corroded beyond recognition, others still carrying glassy wounds along their edges where a plasma arc sliced them apart. As you trace their shapes with fogged eyes, you hear a voice. So, sleeper, you all thawed yet? Yeah, almost. Never seen one of you come in like this. New frames must have better perseverance in Sub-Zero Vac. Seen more than a few of you frozen solid, to, uh, frozen solid to hull plates or inside outer locks in my time. They weren't so lucky. I made a real mess of that. Apologies. <laughs> Dragos comes into focus, shrouded in makeshift tech, his headset with its glinting eyes, the mark of a drone operator. On his shoulder, one of his symbiotically linked drones perches, its irising eye locking you with an unflinching stare. It's sort of cute, but its legs also have a real, um, finger-like suggestion, which is a bit unsettling. Last living sleeper that came through this yard was a while ago. They didn't last long. You struggle to read his expression beneath the tech, but he seems lost in memory for a moment. Or perhaps he's just figuring out what to do with you. Yeah, what happened to them? He ignores your question. I won't ask what led you to do it, to sell yourself to a corporation. And I suppose you know you can't go back. Your old body, that's theirs now. You're just software. A rogue emulation, illegally possessing corporate property. A lot of, um, a lot of common themes between this and some other things we've recently played. You nod along. You remember biometrically signing the forms, the cold floor on your feet as you padded to the sleeper cells. The promise of a life off-world. But, as you do, you get the now familiar sensation that these aren't your memories. These are things you know, but not things you feel. You are no longer that person. You're an offshoot. A copy. And what you won't know is what's ahead. At least, the last one didn't. There's no easy way to put it. A body of yours has fallen apart. It's the same for any sleeper who makes it out. Asinarp wants to protect their property. But if they can't keep hold of you, well, no one can. 
You remember that too, or at least rumors of it from the other sleepers. Planned obsolescence, a built-in dependence on the regularly administered supplements that were part of your routine. Stop taking them, and your body begins to shut down, separate from your emulated mind. How long has it been? How long do you have? But for now, sleeper, you're one of the lucky ones. Dragos glances up and away toward the glassy dome of the yard. The eye is the best place you could be right now. I'm gonna stay silent because I bet he'll elaborate without my interjection. Dragos impatiently shifts his weight. Look, I've got things to be getting on with. He trails off. There's an old freight container I've been using as storage out in the stacks. We haven't been pulling in much valuable scrap these days, so you're welcome to it. Well, I, I guessed wrong, I guess. Something wells up inside of you. Emotion? Fatigue? You shakily get to your feet. All right, you head on up there. You look like you need some rest. And with that, Dragos stalks back into the wrecks, his drones already converging on a rusting hulk. Plasma flashes silhouetting his spindly figure as he returns to work. I mean, maybe there wasn't a plan, right? Maybe it was just like, get out, put yourself into a ship, and just something will happen, hopefully. Welcome to Erlen's Eye. Life on the Eye runs in cycles, during which you can talk to characters, explore areas of the station, and perform actions. At the end of each cycle, you need to head to your current home to rest, which will move time forward on the station. Head to the empty container to rest and end this cycle now. Okay, that is actually nothing. This is just our character sheet. Okay. Interesting. So these, um... Gaining a point of something unlocks these abilities. It's not like these abilities are unique to the class body. Okay, that's interesting. And I mean, the numerical value, I'm sure, means something as well. All stuff we will figure out in time. All cycles need to end, rest, and prepare for the next one. There's also that symbol at the bottom of the screen that I didn't, uh... Okay, yeah, it's mummy. That's kind of what I figured. Stored in airwalled sticks of memory known as chits. So you wake up, or you wake, curled up in the corner of the container, and begin slowly assembling the world around you. After all this time, you still find this body, the one you wake in now, strange and disjointed. Its message is readable, but somehow wrong. You sit up, pulling the mylar blanket close against the cold. Here you are, on this ruined station, millions of miles from anyone you know. Are you still in the system? Did any of the others make it out? It's impossible to know. After all this, what matters? Well... I mean, it does... I hate to I hate to be so selfish, but it does seem like these questions are sort of like they're academically interesting, but not really relevant to our way forward. It is unclear if we have escaped. Escape would come first, but once we're out, I guess it is just like a matter of going forward. Let's make sure that we're actually clear, or at least as clear as we can get. The colony, your indentured service, that's in the past now. No point digging through the fragments. You need a path ahead, a way of keeping this failing body going. If you can keep yourself alive, perhaps you can find a way off this station and out of this system for good. Dragos has left a few comforts in the container. The mylar blanket, the bedroll you slept on, a canister of water, a makeshift electric stove, and some faded sa sachets of some desiccated powder. You thumb the power stud of the stove and begin to boil the water. The contents of the sachets smell like damp wood and you sprinkle them into the liquid. As the pungent smell washes over you, images of your restless sleep come back to you. A ring, like the station, but skeletal and ghostly. A web of threads pulling at your skin. A constellation of bright polygonal shapes, like angular suns, burning into your mind. There's something unpleasantly visceral about these images, and it is long after you finish drinking that they begin to fade. You tidy away the stove as best you can and try to gather enough energy to greet the day. Okay, so we do still have to eat. 
Uh, your condition represents the current state of your artificial body. It depletes by one segment each cycle and can also be damaged by violence, injury, or lack of food. If your condition bar empties, you will suffer a breakdown. You'll have to figure out how to recover your condition now that you no longer have access to car the corporate pharmaceuticals that were keeping you alive. At the start of each cycle, you roll your action dice. I, do, I, I have to say I'm a little surprised. There's definitely a little bit more, like, game here than I was expecting. From the little bits of things I'd been told, I was expecting it to be much more similar to, like, a, like the storytelling style in Norco, you know, or like a, a visual novel kind of thing. Uh, the number of dice rolled is based on your current condition. The worse your condition, the fewer dice you have. Once you've used your dice, you cannot take any further actions and must rest to recover them. So... This is our condition bar. My guess is that the these displays are linked in that, like, if, if condition is here or lower, we don't have access to this die, and then when it falls to here or lower, we lose access to, uh, to that one, probably. Uh, third, energy. You also need to eat, sadly. You can refill your energy bar by eating, but first you'll have to find somewhere to get food and currency to buy it. Energy depletes by two segments each cycle, if it becomes empty, you will be starving, and condition will deplete at double rate. Cool, great, excellent. So, what do these dice mean to me, though? Step out of the container. Dragos is, is stood in the corridor when you close up the container. I guess this is a, this is a little bit of um, British English here, I think. He is still wearing his headset, and in the harsh light of the corridor, you realize it is implanted. A drone sits on his shoulder, its cache of sensor eyes rapidly ri uh, irising. How are you feeling? Honestly, not so good. The drone chirps. Dragos nods. You notice that beneath the operator's rig, his skin is marked by burns and blotches. Now, I know the container isn't much, but it'll keep you safe. He pauses. So... I'm not going to chit-chat too long. You well enough to work? Work? Look, I'll be honest with you, sleeper. I didn't pull you out of that container out of the goodness of my heart. He looks away. At the yard, it's simple stuff. We hack these old hulls down, sell them off to the shipyards or the bright market dealers for cryo. Occasionally, we pull out some tech, maybe something with a bit more value, but most of what comes in is scrap. It's hard to find good hands here, but I figure as a sleeper you'll be used to the manual labor, and obviously I'll slip you a few chits of commission based on what you turned up. What you turn up. I mean, we have the basic idea of chits already, but I guess let's ask. Maybe there will be some nuance to them that is not immediately obvious. These. He pulls out a hand, a handful of small metal bars, Airwald Cryo, isolated from the market. It's what we use to trade out here. He stuffs them back in a pocket. He shuffles his feet nervously. Look, I, I wouldn't usually do this. In my opinion, you'd be best suited moving on as quick as you can. And sleepers, well, he trails off. But things being the way they are for me at the yard, I need the help. Why is that? The things are a little tight, that's all. I owe a little cryo to a client here or there. He pauses, thinking of something else to add. Uh, look, just come down to the yard when you're feeling fresher. There's plenty to do. He nods distractedly and turns and walks away, the drone hopping along ahead of him. Uh, see you later, he calls back. Yeah, I kind of figured we didn't really have a choice here. He's trying to be gentle about it, but that's the deal, right? I literally don't have a way to be moving on anyway. So down to the yard with us. Actions are the primary way you interact with the world of Citizen Sleeper. To perform an action, click and drag your chosen action dice to the slot. Uh, we have repeatable actions. Actions reward you with clock progress, energy, conditions, or items based on their outcome. There are three types of outcome. Yellow. Uh, action goes better than expected. Okay, so that's why the dice are partially colored. Neutral, the action succeeds. Or red, the action fails. Okay, so we like fives and sixes. I mean, that's pretty intuitive. I might... Hold on a second. I'm going to tab out of this. I hope that the sound won't fall out. I'm just going to bring the audio down a tiny bit here. 
Okay. Hopefully that's hopefully that's still good in the mix. Uh, all right. Actions display information about their type, the risk level, uh, and the skill and modifiers that apply to them. So yeah, this is an engineer action. That's an endure action. Uh, critical actions can only be performed once. If an action is safe, there is no loss of condition, energy, or cryo. If an action is risky, a negative outcome means cryo or energy loss. If it's dangerous, a negative outcome means condition loss. And a neutral outcome can still have cryo or energy loss. Okay. That's bad news. Uh, and then modifiers. This is added to the action dice when slotted and improves its value. Some actions require a plus one. So the modifier is our related skill modifier. That's what these, that's what the numbers on the skills mean. Okay. So a plus two is pretty powerful then. If five is completely safe, So Dragos is tied up in something ugly. We know this. If he misses a payment or two, things can get nasty. Uh, also, every salvager knows that they are always just one lucky haul away from their next payday. So we can get progress on the clocks from things. This hull dissection is risky, but it's an engineering action. So let's drop our four in that, because it'll be totally safe with the plus one, right? Wait, do I not understand how the... Okay. No, five is still... Five is still... Five is 50% positive, 50% neutral, which is totally safe on a risky action because the neutral outcome doesn't involve any any penalties, right? I think, I think I'm. that's what I'm remembering. Let's go ahead and do it. Even the rustiest hull can hide valuable components and materials. Extracting them means cutting carefully and skillfully, which apparently is a thing that we know a little bit about. Uh, actions often progress clocks. Clocks are displayed below the actions that fill them, and they track your actions and how they affect the world. Filling a clock means something, good or bad, is about to happen. Some clocks, such as the one tracking Dragos' debt, are cycle clocks. These clocks tick themselves once each, once each cycle and can complete without player input. Okay, so this is like the amount of time Dragos has left to figure out his situation. <laughs> the number of cycles. Okay. This is really interesting. There's a lot of um, sort of like modern tabletop RPG design going on in here. Like this idea of clocks is definitely... I can't remember exactly what game I was reading about recently that has this exact idea with this exact terminology in it. But yeah, that's really interesting. So, we're doing good work on the hall. I mean, the five is really safe. It's going to take some time to sort and cut your way through the sewers of salvage, but you're no stranger to hard labor. So, we're okay at endure, and it's a safe action, so it seems like a good place to burn our low dice. And it feeds the clock just the same, right? Uh-oh. Drives and navigation. In Citizen Sleeper, you will unlock drives as you discover more about yourself and the world. Drives guide you in pursuing specific objectives depending on which path you wish to take. You can track drives, and any tracked drive will place a yellow marker on locations that will help to pursue it. Okay. You are now free to explore Erlen's Eye and make a life for yourself here. Try tracking a drive to help you survive. Yeah, that's a good sort of base goal, huh? Look for food to keep your energy up and a way to recover condition. Fill clocks to progress stories and find new opportunities. Remember to end cycle when you're out of things to do. Okay. Yeah, negative outcomes still plus cryo. So, I don't necessarily feel like we owe Dragos repayment. Like, he's obviously in a tough situation. And I do feel bad about that. I want him to, you know, broadly, I want people to to be doing well and to not be crushed by the, the exigencies of the system they exist under. But also, like, the situation he's put us in here is coercive, right? He He's uncomfortable with that. He doesn't like that he's done that. But his needs drove him to, the way he understands it is, his needs drove him to do something that is like, that he recognizes as immortal or immoral and 
I have to sort of agree. <laughs> All right, I need access to corporate pharmaceuticals or my body's literally just going to fall apart on me, it sounds like. So let's um, let's have a look around the station, maybe. What what have we... Okay, it's actually very large. Well, walking around and just, like, exploring everything shouldn't cost us any resources, I think. So let's start with that. We'll just start at one end. Okay. The shipyard construction yards. Uh, let me... Sorry, let me close this. So, over here, we could assist a shipbuilder. You don't have connections, but you do have skills. If you can get a shipbuilder to notice them, we can maybe get hired on to a more, a more lucrative crew. Uh, the only way to get to know the shipyard is to work there, so we can sort of, like, accumulate familiarity with what's going on in this area. And the shipyard, where they do the, the work on the functional ships, is probably our only way off, right? Our only way further out. Uh, we can also haul materials. It's a dangerous endure action, though. Uh, how did I... This is a little, um, this UI is a little strange. Okay, right-click is zoom out. We can, we can WASD around the ship, but we cannot, uh, WASD out of the locations. So there's my container, there's Dragos's yard. Uh, merchants willing to run the gauntlet of the Helion systems are, are, are rare, but those that do always return eventually. So something will happen here at some point. We, we can't really interact with that. The Rotunda. Having its security have to have plans, and stealing them would be the fastest way to get to know this place. Also the most dangerous, and it's not the kind of thing we're particularly good at. Getting to know the rotunda doesn't mean uh, doesn't just mean new places to visit. It means keeping your eye on new arrivals as well. So this seems like a valuable clock to fill. Uh, Havenage run the rotunda, and their security watches the docks. So okay, this is a clock that's advanced by succeeding on things. That's the plus, and this is a clock that's advanced by um, failing. I assume. And the things here are high danger, so we want to spend good dice. We could just explore. Stealing the dock plans is a thing we can only attempt once, but we can just find our way around. I'm inclined to maybe spend our five here. Wait, is that not... Okay, sometimes sometimes I click an action into place and into... Or the, uh, the click the die into place and it's just like, no, 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 no. You don't want to do that. Yeah, let's, let's explore a little bit. I guess I probably should have looked at the rest of the locations before making that call. Okay, we got two ticks on that clock, actually. We will come back here tomorrow with with more high dice. Because, yeah, like, figuring out the other the other stuff around the station seems really important. So this ship is not just, it's not just art. This is actually something. Hey, you. Want to earn a chit? Ankita stands beside a, lar a huge pile of tied-together hull plates. She, sh she stretches out her back, her shoulders bulging beneath her flight suit. I'm going to push. Make it two. Ankita laughs. <laughs> this goddamn station. She sighs and pinches the bridge of her nose. All right, uh, come here then. You cross the docking concourse as she begins to split the plating into two bundles. What is it with this place? She asks as she angrily lashes the massive plates together. Everyone wants their cut. She straightens up to an imposing height, her armor plates creaking, and looks you up and down. Or is it just that you all think I'm an easy mark? Well, we all need to survive. Listen, like, I'm doing the same thing to her that I was just mad at Dragos for doing to us. But that's the horror of capitalism, right? Like, it creates all these forces and tells us that it creates all these forces that it uses to divide the weakest members of the system against each other. And then tells us that those forces are natural and in fact virtuous in many cases. Look, we all need to survive. No, actually, you know what? I'm not going to excuse it. She's right. I'm being an asshole. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to excuse that. Ankita softens. I get it. I do. She shakes her head. But if I could just go one cycle without some jumped up grifter trying to take me for an idiot, you know, that would be nice. Ankita hoists one bundle of plating onto her shoulder. Come on, then. Enough chat. You've got to earn those chits. 
She struggles, uh, you struggle to shoulder the plates, but you do eventually. Ankita gives you a look. Ships this way. And she sets off down a gantry at impressive speed. As you catch up to her, she turns down a passage, pushing through a small crowd of stevedores. Hmm. Let's show a little bit of concern for her, because I do feel really bad now. Like, we need the money, but I also feel like a, I feel like a real piece of shit. You mean, why aren't I hiring these good folk? She nods back at the stevedores. I paid Havenage enough. They're currently rinsing me for a mooring I can't vacate unless I either fix the ambergris or sell it off as scrap. I mean, yes, the context is clear here. Well, what's wrong with it? It? Ankita looks at you pointedly. She. She rapidly turns another corner as you trail behind. She got cut up pretty bad on our last job, and I had to moor up here for a spell. But since then, it's only gotten worse. Someone got in and sliced the core from our ship mind. So now she's gone dark. She shifts the panels on her shoulder. The upshot is that I'm short one ship mind with a ton of repairs to do, and the rest of the crew signed off the moment they got wind that I've been stranded. So, yeah, it's been a time. Okay, I feel like an asshole. This is, th this is an expression of remorse. Is there anything I can do to help you? Well, I don't know. You got a ship mind tucked away on that frame of yours? For a moment, you aren't sure if she's serious. Ankita swings the plate from her back, almost knocking you over in the process. This is me. She hauls the second bundle off your shoulder. You're the first person I met here who might actually be considered helpful. That's... that's very sad, considering. She pauses, chewing her bottom lip. Alright, look. You want to help? Come see me. I need a hand putting Amber back together, and you don't seem like the type to try anything stupid. She passes the bundles of plates through the Ambergris's outer lock and then turns back. Just don't go spreading all this around. Ankita throws you a couple of chits. She gives you a parting nod and ducks through the doorway. All right, get out of here, she calls back, and the lock slams shut. You know, if we can make her ship functional again, if we can help her make her ship functional again, maybe she'll... Maybe she'll, um, let us come with her when she gets off to the station? Oh, I can only be tracking one thing at a time. I see. Well, let's let's put the doctor thing on. Let's keep this on first. But yeah, this is important. This is clearly very important. So when I click on it now, okay. Ankita has a couple of glitch repair drones in storage. If you can rewire them, they can repair the ambergris for you. But it requires us to have at least a plus one in interface to even attempt it. Uh, also, we have to be careful. We could very easily break this ship. Fortunately, hull repairs are an engineering task, so it's a thing we should be good at sometime. Sometime when we have better dice. Uh, let's stop by the bar. So we can get a drink for, oh, n just a quarter of our total money. You're unsure if your frame can even metabolize alcohol, but this fungal drink fermented along the greenway seems like a good test. So we can sort of, like, make ourselves known around here, slowly but surely. We can also buy food. We're gonna need to buy food. Alright, we'll come back here. I Let me make sure there's not something more pressing that we need to spend our money on. Our energy is bad, though. We definitely do need to buy food. Uh, it takes several cycles to reach the starward belt and return, loaded with scrap from the old racks. Okay, so ships, salvage ships will show up here eventually. Here in the Bright Market, we could ask for directions. That's the sort of a direct engagement that I'm not any good at. Why wander when there are hundreds of people that live and work in this area? Just, just go talk to a stranger. I don't know if there's anything more terrifying that we could possibly be asked, asked to do. But... Get some knowledge. Could be awfully useful. The smells, sounds, and buzzing activity of the Bright Market make it a dizzying place to wander, but an enticing one, too. Probably more useful to do so when you feel like you can afford to spend some money. Here we have the passage into the Low End. After some spacers caused some trouble in the Low End, Yadagan have imposed a toll for entry. No one gets in without paying what seems to me like a truly huge amount of cryo at this moment. Okay, so... 
things with the yellow dot on them are the things that are related to our drive. If I swatch to, if I swip to if the, if I swap or switch either one, just say the say the whole word. Yes. Okay. The yellow the yellow dot does go away, and we end up having a yellow dot here. Okay. So we suspect that getting familiar with the bright market is probably the way to find a doctor. Uh, but the tasks here are a bummer. And they're not things that we're particularly good at. All right, let's go buy some food. Yep, all right, we needed it. That's a lot of money, though. And then back to Dragos's yard, I guess. There's a thing we can do here with a bad die that hopefully will hopefully will give us some love. Okay, bad outcome is still some cryo. And then we just go to sleep. And so this is going to dump two bars off of our energy, one bar off of our condition, and as such, we're only going to have three dice for tomorrow. If I'm understanding this correctly. It might be the it might be the case that one one pip down still gives us that fourth die. We'll see if you have to be at this point or beyond it. This time you don't wake up. Instead, the ghost of the station, that shifting skeletal ring, surrounds you. For a moment, you're gone, absent from your own body, stretched out across a colorless void. Then the connections begin to establish themselves, threads tugging on the edge of your mind. These threads have become vectors of exchange, and then extensions, as you feel your thoughts slipping away down them, dissolving into the millions of distributed nodes they connect to. You see the station, no, you feel the station, like a web of texture in a smooth black liquid. It feels to me... It's like our character is bad at engaging, right? Let's, let's just go ahead and put our hands on it. Feels like maybe not the way we would go. We'll just take a moment to observe. Even though you have no eyes, no sight, you see and feel the map of the station. No, not the map of the station, but the map of its connections. It is a looped cloud with spokes and spires that jut out into space. It is an ingrown thing full of obsolete loops and severed pathways. It is a system, a map, and a territory all at once. You notice a tugging feeling, pulling at you insistently as if it were a small child. Somehow it is pulling in two directions at once. You look down. And all of a sudden, everything shuts off. You come back trembling into this unfamiliar body, both yours and not yours, all at once. You find yourself standing in the container, eyes now open to the dark steel walls. You feel a change within you, a shift. You close your eyes for a second, and you feel it waiting there, the station splayed out across your mind, a storm of connective nodes waiting to be explored. And then it's gone. Okay, yeah, so we have to be past this point to... We did roll 566, though. If you're only going to get three dice, that's a pretty fine way to do it. So... Feels to me like we should definitely do some, some repairing here. It can't be this simple. And we do have to find a doctor. That's, that's something that's going to happen in a real hurry. Let's take these good dice down here. So I'm going to throw a six on ask for directions. We can't get a negative outcome. We could get a neutral outcome, and the neutral outcome could involve a loss of cryo or energy, both of which would be bad. But also, this is literally the best we're ever going, the best shot we're ever going to have here. I could wait until... I mean, it definitely seems like we're able to advance our skills, so I could just wait until we get... I could wait until we get a point and spend it on engage, but it does feel like... 
it doesn't feel like committing to the person that I'm imagining our character being to spend our point fixing our engage instead of spending it increasing the other skills. Like, I'm just going to take the swing here. Come on, coin flip. Okay, we got the neutral. So we lost some cryo, but we acquired a lot of knowledge in doing it. And now we can throw the five onto this. And even a neutral action, I bet, actually gets you the point. Or a neutral outcome, rather. We only need one. Save that six. Okay, neutral outcome is plus local knowledge, and the clock is full. So... There we go. We discovered more than I was expecting. Got a street food vendor here. Emphis is busy, his broad face uplit by the ma makeshift gas burner in front of him. With precise, delicate movements, he lays thick chunks of marinated fungus into a dented wok, his other hand idly tossing a metal bowl of sliced vegetables in some red-flecked dressing. The smell is incredible. I really like the art in this game. You watch as he fulfills a set of orders, heaping the fungus with the bright salad and de uh, depositing it in plastic trays. A stack of chits ra rattles in his apron pocket as customers file past the burner, handing over payment. I wonder if we can get food from him cheaper than we're buying it at the at the bar. Maybe we could do some work for him and 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 get a, get a little bit of favor going. I'm just gonna watch for a moment. I think this is the thing of our character, right? We we watch first. Our character is the very embodiment of Lurk Moore. Despite the cue, Emphis doesn't rush. He dresses each portion individually, squeezing precise slugs of liquid from an assortment of bottles into the bowl of torn leaves and bright slices, before tossing them loosely together. Occasionally, a waiting customer might, might mutter something about efficiency, but Emphis remains steady in his progress. Process in his process. After a while, the queue fades back into the crowd, and Emphis st uh, sets down his metal bowl and looks up across the burner to see you watching him. I can feel your eyes burning a hole in my bowl. Free sample? Uh, yes, please. I'm not in a position to be turning down free samples. He gestures neatly. Come over. The smell is almost unbearably strong as he cooks. The earthiness of the fungus laced with something so spicy the smoke makes your eyes water. The heat from the burner is like a bonfire, and your skin hardens in its glare. I know you, you sleepers. Emphis says while he cooks, his voice deep but clear. A hard life, a lot of stories. He glances up from beneath his cap with piercing eyes. I know. Okay, I'll tell you a story. I guess, I, guess, I guess we could interpret that as a request. You begin to tell him about your journey to the eye, and he nods as he cooks, his eyes never leaving his work. You tell him of the confusion, the pain, but also the sense of possibility and its sudden arrival. You tell him of the cold and dark of the container, and the endless cycles spent within it. Now it seems, you tell him, like some dream you once had, but can never forget. You tell him that the eye excites you and scares you. You're unsure where to walk, where to look, what to do. Eventually you tail off, running out of words. He places a, pa a plastic tray of steaming fungus in your hand. Next time we can talk some more, he smiles. But next time you pay. He slams a heavy hand against a button on the burner's side and it shuts off. The roar of the flame and its impressive heat fades. Next time then, sleeper. He waves you away and begins to oil the walk. Before you turn back to the alley, you notice the geometric patterns of circular scars across his forearms, each surrounded with a constellation of glinting pin marks. Hmm. You walk away, and as you do, you take a bite of the rich, spicy, delicately sweet fungus. Your taste sensors light up like a fusion reactor. You'll be back. Okay. 50%, at least 50% more effective than the food we were eating before. Do we, can we get a sense of the cost? Okay, so it's it's the same cryo to energy ratio, uh, but if we eat here, we can acquire familiarity with Emphis, which seems like it could be valuable. The 
Port Exchange. So we can play the exchange. The flow of chits and components in the exchange is complex, but a sharp eye and some tight trades can net you a good margin. Uh, and we can sell off scrap components, which we can get thanks to our abilities, right? Our, our single ability, you know, that one ability we have. Uh, let me access my character. So anytime we take an engineer action, we could get a random scrap item that we might be able to sell here. That's potentially high value. Hard to know exactly how much we get. It's an old ship mine fabrication stack in the back of the market, but only trusted traders get access to it. So, I mean, this makes a lot of sense, right? Do engineering actions as much as we can to get scrap, sell the scrap here to make money for food, and while doing so, potentially earn access to the ship mine thing that um, Ankita is going to need. Okay, we have a plan. Let's go talk to Sabine. Next comes the call from the enforcer at the door. You shuffle down the flickering hallway toward the open apartment door. You keep your head down and your shoulders high in the queue, trying not to bring attention to yourself. You were thankful for the tip-off that a doctor was operating out of this place, but now you're here, you aren't so sure. The gang enforcer on the door, the flickering light strips, the decaying hab block, they've all made the long queue a test of your nerve. But options are few. And without a supply of stabilizer, this body, your body, will... You suppress a shiver and shuffle forward to the front of the queue. You try to find something to distract yourself. Uh, gee, which one of these things do I think is more likely to be useful to us? I guess try to look inside? You lean against the doorframe and look into the apartment. The entryway is dark, punctuated by the green indicators of stacks of sealed containers. You lean in and see amber light filtering through a far doorway, screened with plastic sheeting, beyond which blurred shapes move. The slap of the enforcer's palm against the doorway jerks you awake. Wait your turn, he growls. After a few moments, a figure pushes through the doorway and you catch a distant voice. Send the next one in, Toshiro. The enforcer jerks his head and you slip inside, passing through the dark entryway and pushing through the plastic sheeting on the far door. The room beyond is bathed in warm light. A floor-to-ceiling transparent panel gives a full view of the bright market's sealed roof and the buzzing traffic above, and for a moment you are transfixed by the motion. Come, sit, says a sharp voice, and you see a silhouetted figure turned away, replacing the plastic sheeting over the frame of a simple folding bed. You make your way across the room. The figure turns, and as they do, you see an expression of confusion flash across their features. They open their mouth as if to speak. They blink, and then quickly regain their composure. Please sit. They gesture to the bed, then turn to an open case of tools on the table. You sit. Sabine turns, a compact diagnostic scanner of some kind in their hand. They hold it to their eye. Remain still, please. Their tone is clipped and businesslike. You stare ahead, still dazed from their expression when you entered. Fear, recognition, sadness unmistakably etched across their face. Yeah, we got clocked. Great. How long have you been on the station? They ask, the scanner still to their eye. Um, I'm not gonna... They're probably gonna... I don't know if I think that sharing information is a good idea, but I also don't know how necessary it's going to be, we probably don't want to be on Sabine's bad side. I'm going to answer. We'll, we'll tell them whatever they want to know. A few cycles. They nod. Well, that's good. To, it's good you came to me. They set the diagnostic scanner on the table. I'm going to start by assuming you don't know anything. They take your arm and roll up your sleeve, inspecting your synthetic skin. Your body is dying. They say it without ceremony, without drama but not without empathy. SN ARP doesn't like to see its proprietary technology let loose. To prevent bodies like yours, frames as they call them, from being stolen, repurposed, or in your case, escaping, they built in a process of so-called planned obsolescence. Frames decay rapidly when not regularly injected with a stabilizer, one which SN ARP remains the sole producer of. They look up. Sound familiar? So it's really interesting that she did restate a thing that we were explicitly told, and I wonder if that intro text is different depending on which class you pick. 
Because it does seem like that's information that we might be particularly aware of due to being an engineer, right? Yes, this does sound familiar. Good. That may help. They swap to your other arm, running some thin metal device over your skin. You feel your forearm tremble. I'm sorry, Sabine says, and you're unsure if they mean for the cold touch of the metal or everything else. Emulations like you, sleepers, as most people know you, aren't classified as people in any of the surrogate subsystems. You have no rights, no status. They focus hard on the inspection of your arm. And as an ARP has no reason to really stabilize her into the market. Sabine looks up as if to apologize again, but they stop themselves. I know little of this is of use to you. They turn away, disassembling the metal instrument and cleaning it. Silence fills the room as Sabine works, and then the silence gives way to tension. You stare at their back, willing them to say something. Anything. Sabine turns to face you. I may be able to help. They sigh, and you see the darkness under their eyes, hear the fatigue in their voice. They gesture to the door. You saw Toshiro outside? You nod. He works for my benefactor, Yatagan. They are influential in the low end. They give me this space to work, run the door, and take the profits. At the same time, I have to fi fix up their enforcers, tend to their implants, sew up their wounds. They look away. But Yatagan has connections. Smugglers from the Starward Belt, mercenaries working for the corporations on Ember. If they can source the stabilizer, maybe you'll have a better chance. Sabine sets down their slate, their notes complete. This... this is dangerous, and it'll be expensive. But I think we can do it. I am sort of curious why they're willing to help us. But you know, you don't get into the... you don't get into the business of being a street doctor if helping people is not, like, one of your natural impulses, right? This is not fun work. Maybe the best thing to do would just be to accept it and not prod. I feel like let's not prod. Thank you. Sabine walks away to the window, their face dappled by the shadows of passing drones. Let's just see if this works first. I'll let you know when I have a lead. You nod and leave, Sabine still staring out, unmoving. When you reach the lower level of the market, you look back up through the panels of the roof to see if you can see their face, but the room looks dark against the lights of the market. You duck your head and walk off into the crowd. Okay. So all there is to do now is wait. We have to wait for a ship to come in. Okay. It'll take Sabine a couple of cycles to talk to Yad again. Fair enough. But... We've also been given the indication that ships coming back from the Starward Belt are the ones that might be responsible for any smuggling, so it's probably worth checking with the salvagers and just seeing when that clock ends. So I think the smart move for us now is to go back to Dragos's yard, do some engineering ship work, try to find some scrap. Um, I know that, well, this is an engineer test too, I mean, getting the ship mined isn't going to fix anything if the hull isn't also functional. And we could get we could get scrap parts just as well here. Also, though, like... I feel like we got it. I'm like, I'm really torn about how much I want to be helping Dragos. Because, like, obviously... Dragos did something horribly selfish with basically sort of like waking us up into indentured servitude, but he did it because he needed to, and he's in trouble. <sighs> Bloody hell. All right. I'm really good at engineering is the thing. <laughs> okay. Two, two charges for that and also 15 cryos. So that'll pay for our food tomorrow. And with that, I guess we go. I gotta tell y'all, I, I like this very much. Like, the structure that has so far revealed itself to us. Um, I am way, way into this. Again, the skeletal ring of the station fills your mind. It sparks with glittering lights, like stars reflected in a winter lake. It is clearer, 
crisper than before. The threads still pull, but you remain in place, flickering in the flow. Between the threads, you see bright shapes, caches of simmering light, uh, shimmering light beneath transparent crystal forms. You follow the path of a thread across the ring, through these forms, then leaping off into the void. You begin to understand. These are nodes and connections, a map of information, of communication. There are so many layers, so many loops that it seems almost impossible to parse. But you begin to try. So... Our character's, like, bad with direct engagement with people, right? This is something that I obviously uh, can relate to a lot on a personal level. And part of the way it's always worked for me is to just sort of, like, sit back and watch the way that people in a space interact with each other because those are the behaviors that you need to imitate to mask, right? And masking is a big part of getting by for certain people when you are the way that I am. So... Both of these options are versions of that, but I think the, like, the, the, the core difference here is this is paying more attention to the people in organizations, to the things that are interacted with, while this is paying more attention to the behaviors. And if we're concerned about imitation for masking, it's the behaviors that matter most first. There are more threads than you can count. You choose one that passes nearby and approach it. As you inspect it, you understand why you instinctively chose the word thread when you first saw them. They are not single lines, but rough, fuzzy things, woven from data strings of all kinds. The threads and nodes, passages and puzzle boxes. One leads to another. There's so much here, so many answers, so many questions. All you need to do is follow the paths and open the boxes. You look out across this ghost landscape of exchange and see an opportunity. But then that insistent tugging again, pulling at you. You look down and see two lines, two threads pulling in different directions, as if they were tied around you. Huh. So this is, this is a pretty uninformed choice that we're about to make here. Kind of arbitrarily, the second... The second thread leads in, pulling deep into the station. Your gaze follows it, and this time you see something. A sphere shimmering above a strange angular body. A pulse shoots out from it, passing over you like a torch beam. Testing you. Tasting you. The first thread leads out, away from the station, into the inky black. Someone out there is tracking you, hunting you, following the thread to you. They are in a ship and the ship is approaching ever closer with each cycle. You open your eyes. Time is short. Okay. All right. Something has changed inside you. You can now access the data cloud of the eye, a network of decaying protocols and data caches. While there, you can use dice and items to access systems and extract data. But be careful. These networks are old and strange. Click the I button at the top of the screen to toggle this view on and off. Huh. Okay, well... If we're being careful, I guess we want to access these nodes while we still have sixes in hand, right? This gate keeps traffic out of the, sh uh, the Heavenage Shipyard's internal network. I'm going to have to decide how I'm pronouncing that word at some point. So if we had a cipher, we could get access. The data here is part of a cache tucked away during the collapse. Who hid this and for what purpose? Data actions allow you to extract data from the networks of the eye. They work like dice actions, but in order to unlock them, you must match your dice to the one displayed on the right of the action. Okay, so something of value to do with low dice some of the time. If you have a plus one or plus two modifier in the interface skill, you will be given more possible dice to match. Okay, that's that's actually really nice. You can use any of the dices that match the dice displayed. Words, listen, sometimes sounds just come out of my face. I know that was not exactly right. 
Well, I mean, it's very compelling to spend the two here. Let's not do it just yet, but... So this is just, as far as we know, this is just going to get us something. Data of some kind. We have, we have no idea what. Here... Last timestamp access is a thousand cycles ago. Once a one. A Havenage member is broadcasting on the open network from here, leaving them open to data extraction. That actually seems like a really useful place to spend our two. We might be able to learn something like really meaningful. Uh, this gate conceals a network of systems which have been untouched since the Solheim collapse, which is a thing that I totally know stuff about. Who says I don't? Another keynote that wants a three. Broken open long ago by hackers. Uh, here's another person broadcasting. We might be able to, to snatch something from them. We have another node that wants a one. A Yatagon agent. Some gang, uh, some gang enforcers' implants are chirping out comm signals. Information related to Yatagon seems like a high priority. If we had a one, that's definitely what I would do with it. I'm going to go ahead and drop drop a two into one of these agents. Let's see what we can learn. Okay, we just got a piece of data. Okay, I understand. I understand this interface now. Uh, let's go back up to the real world for, for interaction time. So... I don't suppose there's not really anything else we need to do. We don't need to eat today. It'd be most efficient to wait till tomorrow to go back to Emphasis Place. So, yeah, you know, we're in that classic situation where you can only afford to eat every other day. These things happen. Let's just do some hull dissection. Like I wanna, I wanna help out Dragos, not because, not because Dragos deserves it due to his behavior, but because Dragos deserves it due to being a person. And that's how people, you know... And then also, this whole dissection may get us some parts that we may be able to use for something of value. And we're really good at this. We are pushing his, uh, we are pushing his, his lucky break along quite nicely. And getting very paid in the process, although not acquiring any lucky scrap. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't indicate. Yeah, it doesn't say what the chance is. Oh, interesting. We can use scrap components. So this says scrap components, and this says scrap items. I'm assuming a scrap component is a type of scrap item, probably. But there will also be some stuff we get that won't be useful for this. Maybe. We just had bad luck so far, though. And I guess we've hit the hour. The intention here with this series is to um, to do roughly an hour of gameplay every day. But also, I don't really want to stop right now. We're, we're going to push through this cycle, at the very least. Uh, when attempting to leave the container, we get hit with something. As you close up, a voice echoes down the corridor toward you. Sleeper, wait up! We know someone's hunting us, but we also have a sense that they're far away still. I don't think this is that. I think this is something else that I'm curious. Fang is coming down the corridor toward you, a wonky grin on his broad face. Hey, glad I caught you. Do I know you? He grins. You do now? He puts a hand on your arm. I've seen you hanging around. I, I just want to chat. You, you staying in that thing? He nods back to the container, shaking his head. That's rough. It can be hard to get a start on the eye. He looks away down the passage. Uh, what was it old Erlen said? The eye opens for us all? It's a nice idea, but, well, not always very practical. He glances back at you. We do our best, but it isn't easy. We who? You pass together into the main walkway. Havenage. Hey, we're all one dysfunctional family. Fang puts an arm around you. I I'm not part of the security branch, though. Don't worry. I I I'm with Systems. Systems. Everything the eye runs on. He runs a hand along the passage wall. This place is a ruin, but Systems keeps it spinning somehow. At least, we try to. He stops you in the quiet passage. 
Look, that's not what I'm here to discuss. I, I saw you around, and, well, I, I know a little bit about you sleepers. I have a little proposition for you. He glances around. But, well, this is maybe not the place for it. I have an office just across the way. Give me a cycle or two to prepare, and then when you're settled, stop by. He lowers his voice and gives you a dark look. In truth, I need you. If what they say about you sleepers, well... If what they say is true about you sleepers, well, th there's work to be done. He pats you on the back, his voice bright and his dark look suddenly gone. Stay clean, sleeper. He walks off down a passage, raising a hand in farewell. Curious. All right, we got a two, a four, and a five. We should definitely go eat. That's the thing that's going to need to happen. Okay. And we'll do it again tomorrow. And we have enough money to do it again tomorrow, which is lovely. All right, so tomorrow we'll have... We'll have stuff to pursue, like a lot of stuff to pursue, actually. For today, I guess we just keep working. Let's, um, let's pop back over here. Is that agent still broadcasting? Yeah, let's snipe a little bit of, a little bit more information out of the air. Okay, just some, just some data. Probably useful in some way. As you drift back from the node, something latches onto you. A thread strung tight around you, it tethers you in place. A taste. The voice makes you shiver, its source somehow both distant and close behind your ear. You see a distant glint of light shut off, and then suddenly a shape is at your side. It stalks around you, circling like a shark, like a wolf. Entity unknown, astringent, processing. I don't... Hmm. I don't know what to make of this, and it does make me concerned that resisting could be uh, reacted to. This is some kind of enforcement process in the system, right? Probably. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just stay still. Let's not disturb it just yet. We'll see what happens. But you know, be prepared to run. <laughs> Please hold. Oh, good, cool, good. The thread around you thickens until it is a ring, a cylinder, a tunnel, of, uh, a tunnel of light circled around you. It is blinding for a moment, and then it is gone. As it fades, you see a figure, a creature, in front of you. Its strange head flickers between different angles, reading you. What are you? The shape paces around on light legs, though, though there is no ground here to pace on. Entity, identify. Origin. Serial. Cadence. The figure faces you expectantly. I know what it wants from me, but we can pretend not to know. We could play dumb and just see if it'll give us some more information. I'm going to choose... I, I think what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to choose not to accede to this demand, and we'll see what happens. It might just repeat itself. I doubt it's going to let us go, but I want to see. Refusal. The figure's strange head rotates. Brackish signature. Of and not of. A tempting interface. As the figure speaks, more threads begin to spiral from its head. Thick, snaking, vine-like ribbons that flex and wave. They approach with intent. So I don't know exactly what it is. Uh, I do know that the interface is calling it a hunter. And it's scary. It is certainly scary. But I want to know more. The, 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 critical, the critical downside here is that I really want to know more, and I'm going to let that desire for knowledge overwhelm my desire for self-preservation here. I'm just going to say, no, 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 stop. The figure halts its threads, its head twitching. Entity, your identity is unknown. We only seek to correct illegalities. Can you confirm your legal right to sentience? We have no and roundabout no. I choose roundabout no. I'm a person. Incorrect. You are an entity. All at once, Hunter's head is directly in front of yours, blocking your vision. You stink of their taste. 
the one from the sealed dock. Hunter shimmers with fury. I will find access. I will interface. The sealed dock. An entity hides in the rotunda. You are its puppet. Hunter extends a razor-edged thread. I will not be diverted from my task. It glows with murderous intent. And for some reason, I no longer have the option to run. So, yeah, strike, I guess. It feels like Rudd is, is more sort of like within the character that we're slowly building up here. Uh, but you lash out with all your force. Not a physical strike, but a focusing. A spike of interference leaping out like the tip of a spear. Hunter stumbles, shifts, and separates. And then I wake up. Hopefully. You open your eyes, blinking back into the station light, shaking with fear. Okay, so yeah, that seems bad. Uh, we are definitely being pursued by something in the network, but also it lets slip that there's something in the rotunda, or at least accessible from the rotunda. If we get another six, maybe we should do this. I think I'm going to throw our five into this because we can throw our four back into the dock. Okay. We completed Dock Watcher. What have we gained? The sealed dock. So these old maglocks look like they each need an encrypted key to open. Why the heavy security for a decaying lock? So we'll have to get through two maglocks to get in here, but there's someone in here, and Hunter is very concerned about them, which means they are the kind of person who we might get along with. Uh, and then my feeling is we could just assist a shipbuilder, but like, we've put our hand in this Drago situation already. Let's finish it. Alright, positive outcome. Also, money, hooray. Also, we still we still have not managed to get a single scrap item. You arrive into a buzz of activity at the yard. Red blinking lights flash across a vast dark shape suspended below the dome. They flicker they flicker across scorched hull plates and bent structures, spilling from holes in the twisted shape. The cutter is huge and has been torn apart in some violent encounter. She's a beauty, isn't she? Drago stands to the side, focused on the hulking ship as it is lowered into the yard. What is it? Dragos laughs. That, my friend, is A-grade scrap. I should thank you. This place was on its last legs when you turned up. <laughs> now look at this. The ship descends slowly, its interior visible through multiple hull breaches. You struggle to gather the same enthusiasm as Dragos for this monstrous craft. Uh, you can't help but think of what became of its crew. That's a weird... that should probably be a period. I, yeah, I mean, let's, let's ask. I'm curious about what happened to its crew. What happened? Well, what do you mean? He glances at you. I managed to convince our salvager friends to give it to me on credit. That's what happened. No, no, I mean, what happened to the ship? Also, this is concerning. You know, I'm, I'm here trying to help him, but if he's going to use my help to just like, he's like, well, now with the sleeper here, I could, <laughs> I could afford to get myself more in debt because they'll just help me out of it. I'm a little, a little concerned, but first things first, what happened to the ship? That's not my concern. He shrugs. The ship creaks like a calving iceberg as it reaches the base of the yard. Dragos is visibly excited. I know I said you shouldn't stick around, but I am going to need some help with this one. The drones start to crawl over the hulk, their lights illuminating flashes of dented hull. Watching, you wonder if you arrived in a similar fashion, locked inside that container, the wreck of the Essen Arp freighter lowered into the yard like a corpse ready to be butchered. Or was the container delivered to Dragos on its own? A womb for your rebirth into this strange station. You shudder. 
Perhaps if you could learn something about this ship, you might be able to trace the path that led you to this yard. Yeah, I guess. Is that a thing I care about? I gotta be honest with you, my concern is much more forward-looking than that. Drago squeezes your shoulder. After these past cycles, I think we're up to it. What do you think? You see the fading name of the ship emblazoned on its side. Winter Light. I don't want to make a promise here, because I think I may, at this point, leave Dragos to work on this to some extent while we go deal with the Ambergris. I'm going to stay silent. This is non-committal. A real beauty, Dragos repeats, perhaps just to himself. You take one last look at the shattered ship as the drones start cutting, and then slip out of the yard, feeling suddenly cold in the empty passage. Oh, so we did complete a drive, and I guess that gave us an upgrade point. Each drive completed unlocks an upgrade point. After, uh, access your character menu. Yeah, interesting. Uh... So I'm not so worried about energy recovery. Like, obviously, eating is cryo-expensive, but also there are other benefits to it. I want to keep eating. I want to get to know Emphis. So that I'm not so concerned about... Picking up a point of uh, into it to get predictive reasoning is potentially cool. But also, I wonder if we should just take the other engineering point. Because, like, self-repair seems like it could be very high value. The other thing, I suppose, is maybe we don't do anything with it just yet. We hold off. We see what Sabine has figured out for us. And if it turns out that regaining condition is going to be super difficult, then we pursue self-repair. I think, yeah, I think we're just going to hold it for the moment. Let's see how the thing with Sabine works out, then we'll decide what to do. So, we have a dangerous re uh, engineer action here. So, if we, if we engage in forensic trawling of the ship, which is safe... We can, we can discover the history of the ship. Draco seems increasingly nervous about your presence in the yard. You're not sure he's going to hold his nerve much longer. That's curious. I wonder what that means. But I, I think a thing that's really worth noting here is that Dragos does not seem to be in danger anymore. So maybe we just leave him to it and we focus on the Ambergris, at least for a little while, until the, until the hull is in one piece. Yeah, I think I think that's a reasonable plan. That said, there's nothing else for us to do today. Let's just go ahead and go to sleep. All right. Tick tock. And I think what is this? Oh, that's thing. Right. That seems like a real next time kind of thing. I think that's where we're going to call it for today. Thank you all so much for watching. I am way into this. This is very, very exciting to me. Um, and I hope that it is as exciting to at least some of y'all. <laughs> uh, so the intent here is roughly an hour of gameplay each episode until we have uh, until we have found our way off of the station or discovered whatever other mysteries there are here to discover. So when you come back next time, uh, probably tomorrow, uh... Hopefully, we'll be able to find a way to keep ourselves from slowly falling apart. That seems to be a, a very major concern at this moment. And we'll see you then.